Hi there. We're going to spend a few videos talking about modeling mode. What I have here is a new basic level. Let's go file, new level, and then select basic. And I have saved that level in a directory. And the reason we're doing that is we're going to be creating assets and we need to save them. And this is as good a place as any. So I'm going to go to this drop down here that says selection mode, and we're going to select modeling. And this will bring up our modeling toolkit. And the reason I want to talk about this is it is useful in and of itself, but a lot of these, in fact, almost all of these operations here have analogs in geometry scripting. And we'll be talking about that in more detail a little bit later on in this course. So we're going to start here in the create menu, and I'm just going to show you how it works. You select an object and then I can drop it anywhere I want. And until I hit this accept button down here, I can modify the width or the depth the height, the number of subdivisions. If I hop over to wireframe, you can see I'm adding subdivisions here on the various axes. And you can also modify where the pivot is gonna go if you wanna apply a material. And then this is important. This is where you're gonna save the new asset that we're creating, current folder. So that's gonna put it right here. So if I hit accept and then hop back over to lit, you can see I now have a new box asset. This is not the same thing as if I were to come over here and then go to shapes and select a cube. This will create this cube. If I uh, hop over to where this lives in the, uh, in the content browser, we can see that it's going to be engine content and then basic shapes. And because it is located in the engine, we don't want to mess with it. This thing on the other hand is basically the exact same as if we had created a, a cube in some DCC like Maya or Max or Blender and then imported it in as an FBX. Let's take a look at one more example. We'll grab a cylinder. And it's going to be the exact same thing, right? If I want to modify the radius or the height, we can increase the number of radial slices. Whoops, it'll help if I actually put a wireframe there. You can see we can modify that. And uh, once again, you pivot and material and so on and so forth, we're going to save it. I'm going to hit accept here. And we have just created another asset. We are not limited here to creating primitives. We can also edit them. With a static mesh actor selected, I'm going to come over to the modeling menu and select polygroup edit. Now polygroup edit is going to require that we have a selected polygroup. You can see when I mouse over the mesh here, areas of it are going to light up in green. These polygroups are determined procedurally when you create the primitive by probably face normal deviation. I'm going to go ahead and select one and then we can just do a quick demo here of a few of these operations so we can extrude if you want to do a different kind of extrude you can set this to fixed and then it'll give you like a specific distance that you're extruding uh, we'll hit apply there if i come back over to you do like a bevel if i select this edge bevel you can change the size of that bevel like so so if i hit apply there all these operations i just did if i hit Control z I can back out of each one. If I were to, let's just add one more thing in here. We'll just add a, an extrude. Uh, if I hit accept here, we have now modified the original asset. And if I hit control Z, it's going to back out of that entire operation, right? So no matter how many things I did in my polygroup edit session, while I am in edit mode prior to hitting accept, I can hit control Z and back out of the operations one at a time. As soon as I've accepted it, it turns into essentially one operation. So just a thing to be mindful of. So the polygroups are an important component of working with polygroup edit, and it is useful to know how to set up different configurations. Let's take a look at how to do that. We're going to go to attributes and then generate polygroups. By default, we're going to have face normal deviation. Face normal deviation is going to look at this angle tolerance. If the angles between two faces on either side of an, of an edge uh, is higher than this value, they will be on separate polygroups. And if they are lower, then they will be put onto the same polygroup. So we can see somewhere around like 13 or 14, we are going to exceed the, the angle there uh, between these two faces, and they'll all be put on the same polygroup. We can also use quads and find quads. We can do UV islands. You can do hard normal seams. Uh, connected tries, if you've got a lot of things that are separate mesh elements, but they're all part of one static mesh, this is a, a useful way to uh, edit those at the element level, and so on and so forth. Let's head back over to face normal deviation, because so I'd like to show you something. Because this is a procedurally generated primitive, the angle between one face and the next is going to be the same all the way around. So as soon as I exceed whatever that whatever that angle is, we're, we're going to put everything into one polygroup, all these vertical faces anyway. So what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to apply a little bit of a non-uniform scaling operation and we'll head back over to the same thing, right? So back to the, uh, to the default value. So the angle between these edges is significantly higher than the angle between these edges. This is almost a flat surface there, right? From one to the next. But what you'll notice is as I increase my tolerance, we're still getting that same behavior. And the reason for this is I actually need to freeze the transforms if you're familiar with the term in Maya. So I'm gonna hit accept here. We're gonna head over to the transform menu and I'm gonna be presented with this bake transform tool. So if I select this, we can use the defaults here. If you take a look over at our, our scale, we've got 2.27, one and one. When I hit accept, what's gonna happen is this is going to be set to one. And this will essentially forget that it's been scaled. And then we can hop back over here to attributes, generate polygroups. And now you'll begin to see the expected behavior where we're gonna get the polygroup assignment based on the actual geometry itself because we no longer have a transform that's being taken into consideration on what the face angles are actually gonna be. There are some other useful things we can do in the transform menu. Uh, edit pivot is a great one. If I wanted to come over here, modify the pivot location, there are some procedurally generated locations that I can access fairly easily. You can also punch in any value you want, right? So like while this is selected, if I were to say select the other object here, I can copy the X, Y, and Z location. Unfortunately, I don't think there's a way to do it all at once, but you can pretty easily just paste this in. Uh, and now I have moved the pivot of the cube to the exact same location as the pivot of our scaled cylinder. So that could be very useful for all kinds of operations. I'm gonna go ahead and set that back to the bottom. We'll hit accept there. Let's talk about Booleans. I'm gonna create a sphere with a radius of 200 units. Create a cylinder. Default values there are gonna be fine. And I'm gonna copy the location of the sphere and paste it into the location of the cylinder and then scoot it up just a little bit. Let's go over to the modeling menu and you can see that Boolean is grayed out. That's because I need two objects selected. I'm gonna to go to the Boolean menu you can see the operation here. The first one is going to be difference A minus B, A being the first object that I selected and B being the second. You can choose B minus A, you can do an intersection, or you can do a union, and the union will clear out any of the internal geometry. I'm going to select B minus A, and before you commit the operation, you can actually move your tool around you can change the scale of it and you can rotate it. So I'll just find some position there that takes a nice big chunk. Before I hit accept here, I have a few options to look at. I can either create a new object, I can overwrite the first or second input objects, and I can save it in the current folder. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit accept there. We're gonna create a new object. Let me scoot this out just a little bit further and hit accept. And you can see I now have a new Boolean here, but the icon doesn't reflect what the geometry is showing. And that's because if I tap the G key, we can get our little transform gizmo. It's gonna shoot it in the direction of Y negative, right? So what it's seeing is that, but that's not really super informative in terms of what the, uh, the icon is here. So there's a couple of things that we can do to address that. We can either rotate the object 180 degrees, head over to transform and bake the transform and hit accept. And you can see now I'm getting a more informative icon, or you can come over here to the settings button in the content browser and go to thumbnail edit mode. If you turn this on, you can rotate your object around and set it up to be whatever you want without having to mess with the transforms. Okay, lots more to talk about. In the next one, we're going to cover patterns, deformers, remesh, and simplify, and anything else that I can squeeze in. So stick around for that.